We see a train get out of control and a mom with her baby stuck on the track, but in the nick of time, a man comes and saves them by stopping the train. As the person turns out and gives his hand, the lady says thanks but is shocked to see his face, which seems like a zombie. We see him waking up in his room, and his name is Zombie. He has a dream to be friends with humans, so he helped many humans so that their perspective could change towards zombies. He saved them from a plane crash on the ground, and saved children from a burning building. He wasn't that strong. One day, a zombie outbreak caused a disaster that took place suddenly, and he didn't get a chance to escape. At that time, he was a child, and a zombie had bitten him in school, which makes him an ordinary zombie who follows the mob wherever it goes. One day, humans came up with weapons and murdered the zombies in a genocide manner. They used the zombies for electricity generation through a machine. He doesn't get why zombies eat humans or why humans murder zombies. From that day on, he starts training hard to change himself in order to survive. He worked out to become strong, didn't eat meat. Instead, he ate protein powder for three meals a day straight. He continued to train, even at night, until he became strong. After gaining knowledge and power, he decided to live in human society, following the rules and being the good zombie. He continued to help humans, through which their perspective toward zombies can be changed. He runs out of food, so he decides to go shopping. He went to Yi Hao supermarket to buy stock, and the lady at the counter treated him as a human. They helped him put the stock in the truck. Two men watch him secretly, they have doubts that he is the one who lifted the airplane, and that it might be false information from the media, so they want to expose him. But as he lifts the truck and jumps high, they become shocked. He lands in the city that he conquered for the zombies, and we get to know that he is the zombie king. Mr. Zombie ordered all the zombies to eat eggs instead of human flesh to get the proteins they required. Mr. Zombie went to meet the boss-level zombies in the hall, where we were introduced to Lang, Fur, Ah Gan, Ah Gu, Varmint, and Blackie. They are all SSS rank, danger level zombies. All the zombies greet Mr. Zombie, and he shows Ah Gu the poster that he is wanted again by the humans. Ah Gu apologizes to Mr. Zombie, and Blackie tells his boss that they already had to change their base multiple times to hide from humans. Other zombies suggest fighting humans, while Mr. Zombie disallows them because humans are terrifying. Meanwhile, a sound came from a military plane and it is a lady. The lady is the president of an organization, and the employees report to her that the equipment is ready, and the nuclear bomb will drop in 20 minutes. The president seems to have hatred for the zombies, and Varman asks Mr. Zombie to let him go and cut them. But he declines and goes to handle the humans. The president informs the ground unit to evacuate in 20 minutes, saving the civilians. The president orders a fighter man marshal to handle the boss zombies as they appear. On the other side, there's a boy informing his brother Fee that the people from Extraordinary Academy have found the zombies, and as he gets this info, he drops the prison full of humans into the mob of zombies. The ground unit detected signs of human life and went to save them by murdering the zombies. One soldier is trying to murder a zombie, but it's undestroyable as Mr. Zombie has extraordinary capabilities. A soldier uses a rocket launcher to attack him, but he defends it easily. Another soldier tells his leader, who used a rocket launcher, that he is not a zombie and that he is an extraordinary person who has helped many people, and is famous for wearing a zombie mask. The leader was shocked to hear that, thinking he shot the wrong person. The president informed the marshal that a boss zombie was detected in Zone B, and he jumped from the plane. The boy informs Faye that the president's team has saved almost all the civilians, so he orders him to make it interesting and the boy converts zombie number 69 into his berserk form. The ground unit alerted all as they found a boss zombie had appeared. The squad leader of the ground unit took Mr. Zombie into a secure van and ran out of the place to save him. The girl soldier shows her curiosity to Mr. Zombie as to why he always wears a mask. The boss zombie lifts the bus up and throws it at the soldiers, but at the right time, Marshall comes and cuts the bus. The marshal orders the soldiers to save civilians and evacuate. Marshall destroyed the boss zombie, and when Mr. Zombie hears the berserk zombie's voice, he disappears from the squad. Marshall uses his sword and murders the boss zombie. Mr. Zombie arrived at the spot, and the news that Marshall defeated the boss zombie reached the president. The zombie told Mr. Zombie that it was not the human's mistake as they were not able to control themselves. The marshal heard them and attacked Mr. Zombie. Another boss zombie is detected, and it is none other than Mr. Zombie. 
Before anyone orders Marshall to finish him, his presence disappears from the radar, leaving others shocked. Mr. Zombie hung him without clothes, and the members reported to the president that Marshall got critically damaged, and still there were civilians left to evacuate. The president goes out with lightning speed. The president rashly goes to Mr. Zombie and attacks him with her sword, but as the sword touches him, it breaks into pieces. The president steps back and Mr. Zombie tells her to stop as they can sort out the matter by conversing, but she intends to murder him anyway. The president used her enhanced blade and went straight to him, but he dodged the sword easily. The president used a red blade cleave attack, slashing in a circular motion, but again he dodged her attack by bending down, which made the president angry. Meanwhile, the ground unit rescues the marshal and civilians. A team member reported to the president that all the civilians had evacuated and she could retreat. But she didn't reply to them. The president chases Mr. Zombie, as she has a strong intent to murder him. She used Iado Level 2, which is a Japanese art, and attacked him, leading him to crash into the ground while she landed smoothly. The president's mission is complete, and she orders the team members to lower the plane's altitude and take her back on the plane. A boy informed his brother Fee that they saved all the civilians, and he ordered him to use the spy. The civilians are enjoying being saved, but soon their celebration turns into a tense situation on the president's plane. The pilot is revealed to be a spy, and he releases the nuclear bomb while the president is still on the ground. The plane cabin door opens and the altitude drops lower, but in order to pick up the president, she must jump into the plane, otherwise she can't escape from the explosion. They are running out of time, and the president's leg boosters are not working because they ran out of batteries. Mr. Zombie holds the president and rotates her to get momentum and throws her into the plane. The cabin doors close, and they moved away. Mr. Zombie moved quickly towards the bomb and stopped it in the air, leading the bomb to explode, leaving them all in shock. Mr. Zombie resists the explosion, but his clothes are torn up. Faye tells his brother it is time to go while there is still a life signal in the area of the explosion. It is neither the first nor the last time they have fought against Beyonder's Academy. The president regrets being saved by a zombie, as she spent her life murdering zombies and in the end, one of them saved her. One of her members told her that he was not a zombie, he was a masked hero who lived in the city for a while and liked to hide his identity by wearing a mask. Mr. Zombie calls Varmint to know their whereabouts and he tells him that they all escaped on time and are all saved, looking for a new place to settle down. Mr. Zombie was standing outside of his home when the president saw him in torn clothes through a camera. Later, when Mr. Zombie is doing his daily workout, the president breaks the gate of his house and gets into his home with his team members. She orders his members to bring all his things and reveals they are from Beyonder's Academy. She informs Mr. Zombie that he has been accepted into his academy, and from now on, he is a member of it. Mr. Zombie asks her if zombies can go to school, but she understands he is pretending, so she takes him. One of the members asked the president if it was right to enroll him in the academy as there are strict criteria for recruitment. He didn't get a place to live because the dorms of the academy are planned specially. Mr. Zombie and his stuff shift to the Beyonders Academy, and he is a bit confused if he is going to live in the president's room and sleep on her bed, so he asks her. She understands if he wants to sleep with her, but nothing is like that, and she tells him that he will be sleeping in the guest bedroom. Mr. Zombie told her that he was not a human, but she didn't listen and took out her mechanical leg. She told him her story behind the leg. When she was a kid, her village was attacked by zombies, and her parents became zombies and bit her leg. She had to cut her leg and murder her parents. That's why she hates zombies and has vowed to murder every zombie she meets. Hearing her, he stayed quiet, fearing her, but when she asked if he was saying something, he became happy as she didn't listen to what he said earlier. Mr. Zombie curiously asked her about the Beyonders Academy, and she told him that it's an organization that uses different ways to fight zombies. She tells him that it has been 1,000 years since the first zombie outbreak happened, and after two centuries since the outbreak, their ancestors established the Beyonders Academy. There is only one purpose of the Academy, to fight zombies, and for that they hired talents and nurtured them. Mr. Zombie realized that he had become a zombie in the first outbreak, which means it has already been 1,000 years for Mr. Zombie to be living and struggling to change humans' perception of zombies. The president told him to report to the academy tomorrow, as she had already enlisted him through the back channel. She warns him not to even think of running away because it's not an ordinary academy, and if he doesn't report, then they will investigate to know the reason behind the escape. 
the president reveals her name is Violet, and she tells him that Dawn will bring him to the academy tomorrow while he doesn't know who Dawn is. In the morning, Mr. Zombie meets a girl named Dawn. He asks her identity, and she recalls the moment when they were in the armored personnel carrier. Mr. Zombie reminds her that she was little when they met. Dawn explains to him that he must take an entrance exam where his physical and special abilities will be tested to destroy zombies. She gives him an example to make him understand. If the world record for a 100-meter sprint is 9.58 seconds, then he must finish 100 meters in 9.57 seconds to get admission to the academy. Mr. Zombie understood what Beyonder meant in Beyonder's academy, and he told Don that they were all crazy people. At the exam place, there is a crowd, and Mr. Zombie asks Don if a person has lifted an airplane. Then there is no need for any exam. She tells him that there are many here who can lift airplanes, and all of them have secrets. Chen, the president of the sports department, arrived as the examiner. Chen tells the participants that it has been eight years since the academy was established, and there have been people who have come and gone who fought against the zombie kings who could even split mountains. Mr. Zombie asked Chen what would happen if any zombies were discovered in the academy, to which he replied that they would rip it up and hang him beheaded on the academy gate. It's truly cruel. The first test is the 100-meter race, and as it starts, a participant named Wu Chengsu passes the race within three seconds. The next is a shooting test, and Don won it easily. The next test is shot put, in which a participant must hit 80 meters to pass and 100 meters to be qualified. One group passed, and another failed. Mr. Zombie is stuck with these crazy people, and is controlling his strength to ensure he does not attract any attention. Chen, the examiner, sees Mr. Zombie's score, which makes him pass, while he gets the letter from Violet in which she says that he is strong. This makes Chen suspect that he is pretending to be weak. Wu Chengsu hit the target at 32 kilometers, which made his javelin throw qualified. The next turn is Mr. Zombie's, and he is about to throw. But Chen stopped him and asked him if his name is Zombie, and he is the one who was introduced by the President Violet of the Swordsmanship Department. Chen asked him if he was hiding his true power as Violet told him that he was too strong. Chen told him that he is the one who asked him the question earlier, and everyone is trying to qualify except him. This makes Chen suspect that he is not a person, to which Mr. Zombie replied that he is human, and Chen forced him to show his full strength. Otherwise, he would be treated as a spy and get punished for tricking Violet. Mr. Zombie is ready to throw the javelin, remembering the moment when he practiced for the whole day. Mr. Zombie threw the javelin, cracking the ground, and the javelin pierced the satellite and crashed to the moon, leaving all in shock about his strength. Mr. Zombie left all mouths open with his throw that pierced the satellite. The examiner's face can be seen as he is shocked by his strength. Don was impressed by Mr. Zombie's strength, and now he is a very strong person in everyone's eyes who witnessed his javelin throw. Mr. Zombie is qualified now, so he asked Don if he could go home but she asked him why he would want to win, with the strength he has, can even become president. Dawn explains to him the authority of president with the example of President Violet of the Swordsmanship Department, can not only control the army, troops, and tankers, but even nuclear bombs. She has the highest authority over the city of 30 million people, and even the mayor just helps her. The final decision is hers. Mr. Zombie tells Dawn that he already owns a city, but without believing she takes him to the biotech department, also called the Logistics Department. There is a picture placed there of Professor Janey, who is known as the Logistic Head and was the former biotech president. As his wife died, he started doing a crazy experiment that included humans and zombies, and it is said that his goal was to fulfill his late wife's dream. The Academy dismissed him for his overdoing and ordered them to murder him as soon as they found him. The president of the Biotech Department came, who is the adopted daughter of Professor Janey, and asked if they had passed the exam which they already did. She asks them about the type of equipment they want, and Dawn tells her that she wants equipment that helps her carry more weapons. Dawn is joining the gunner department and asks Mr. Zombie about the type of equipment he wants, but she is scared as she sees his face and calls him Zombie. Dawn makes her believe that he is just wearing a zombie mask, and she saw him when he did his javelin throw, which was amazing. The president believes him as a person because if he was a zombie, then he would have already attacked. Mr. Zombie tells her that he wants clothes that do not tear up because every time he comes home naked. The scene shifts to the swordsmanship department, where the marshal is telling a lady about his fight with Mr. Zombies. As he attacked him, his entire vision turned dark, and within seconds he found himself hanging naked. She asked him if his president could win against him, 
to which he answered that he was even stronger than his president. She asked for his name. She allows Marshall to go. The lady named Jean Lauki is the president of the sword department, and there is a fierce competition between the blade and sword departments that has been going on for generations. Even if one side has one more member, they give birth to the extra member rather than be weaker against their opponent. John wishes the best of luck to Mr. Zombie as she leaves. On the other side, Mr. Zombie and Dawn are taking classes with his friends. The teacher taught them the habits of zombies to use them as an advantage in their traps. They eat eggs also other than flesh. Mr. Zombie makes notes of them to show his family. In the announcement, all were told to assemble at the gymnasium. At the gymnasium, President Violet warns Mr. Zombie and Dawn to be quiet and not to create any trouble for her. A member of Blade Academy told her that with a glimpse, he couldn't say how strong Mr. Zombie is, so he asked for permission to go and test him. Meanwhile, Chief, the president of Mechanical Life Form, arrived there and President Sword took her leave, telling her assistant not to make any trouble because, compared to Zombie, Chief is more important and she respects only the strong. The chief praises President Violet for her hard work. Mr. Zombie asked Don about Chief and if he is strong, to which she told him that Chief is Professor Janie's successful experiment, an evolved human. He is also the only man who has survived thousands of experiments. After Professor Janie was expelled, he formed the Mechanical Life Form Department. His department controlled the city of 50 million people, and during his 10-year presidency, not a single zombie appeared in the city because even if a zombie hair was found, he restricted the area until it was sanitized. The chief gave his speech, thanking the freshmen and asking them to help the academy. He shows them a spy through projection who was caught a few months ago, and because of him, they nearly dropped a nuclear bomb on their own people. Such people should be murdered in an instant, but they have information that the spy is a subordinate of the traitor, Professor Jamie. Mr. Zombie realized that zombies are not only their target. The zombie threat passed a long time ago, and the current conflicts are because of infighting between the Beyonders Academy and Professor Janie. Some people just want to destroy the world. They have tried a lot of methods to let him talk, even with their seniors, but they all failed. The chief requests freshmen to help the Academy. And if anyone makes him talk and gets Janie's location, then the person will become vice president. Upon hearing this, all the freshmen became ready to make him talk and started going by chance to him at the chamber where he kept. After two hours, Freshmen tried different ways and soon turned very desperate. Initially, the methods are normal, but they turn out to be silly later on. Don asked Mr. Zombie if he could make him talk, and Mr. Zombie replies that he can make him sing, which causes Don to break her ice cream stick. Don tells the chief that her friend Mr. Zombie can make him talk, and the chief tells him the way. Mr. Zombie has doubts about him as his subordinates are very obedient to him, but in the past few weeks they have been losing control and the spy might know something about it. Mr. Zombie goes inside to see him, and the spy is not in a mood to betray Jamie. Mr. Zombie gives him a cut on his hand that gives him negligible pain, but as Mr. Zombie orders him to stand up, he does, leaving others shocked. It's a virus that goes to his brain from a cut that makes him talk. Mr. Zombie asked him questions, and he answered. His name is Xiao Kai, and he knows most of the things. Mr. Zombie asked him the reason for Berserk Zombies going out of control, which is because of a medicine created by Jamie and dropped into the city. The zombies that ate the medicine went crazy, and even they could control them up to a certain point. They command the Berserk Zombies to attack humans, and through battles, they collect data on Beyonder's Academy. They are doing it on Jamie's command, and he said he is doing something great. The spy only needs to collect data on Beyonder's Academy members by controlling zombies. Professor Jamie is at a secret base that is 500 meters below the city. Mr. Zombie calls him hateful things and tells him that he put a virus in his brain and that he can trigger it to take his own life. A boy told Brother Faye, Professor Jamie, that his spy has confessed, and they know their location by now. Jamie orders him to continue their work as usual, and it's better if they come for him at his location to witness the historical moment, the birth of a new life form. As Mr. Zombie came back, some were shocked, and some were fearful. However, the chief praises him and asks to come with him to register him as vice president. Mr. Zombie is concerned that Janie will run away, but chief assures him he can't run. President Sword and his mate found it suspicious, as there is no registration process to be a vice president. The chief took him to a deserted place and asked him when he had learned human language. The chief attacked him with his cannon, which has the ability to disintegrate anything. President Zhang was just saved by his mate from the cannon. Chief speaks bitterly. 
He had already disintegrated Mr. Zombie's head, and once a zombie loses its head, it leaves with no ability to move, but Mr. Zombie moves quickly and hits him to the wall. Chief's mechanical robots attacked him, but he destroyed them all, and seeing his quick moves, Chief left with questions. Mr. Zombie tries to grab Chief. He dodges it, and then attacks with a cannon. Mr. Zombie avoids it by bending down. Chief dodges and steps back. Chief seems to be in trouble, but he starts getting serious. Mr. Zombie's head regenerated, and he said to sort out the issue with a conversation as he didn't want to hurt him. Chief takes off his jacket and calls model number one that turns him into its mechanical life form. He didn't talk, and he started fighting seriously. He kicked him in the jaw, threw him into the air, beat him badly, and knocked him to the ground. He used his sender cannon and threw him up, thinking he must be dead already. Mr. Zombie comes out of the smoke and turns to his berserk form. The sky turns dark with the clouds, and no one has seen the sky be so dark with the strange behavior of the clouds. Mr. Zombie becomes serious and asks Chief how he wants to die. President Zhang has a bad feeling seeing him, and they run out of there. Chief never feels threatened by another being, but it's time for him too. President Zhang's mate witnessed that he never saw such a form of zombie and never found such type of zombie in the Academy Library database. They were thinking they would be saved there, but soon it turned out to be wrong as Chief crashed near them with his leg and hand broken. Chief calls models two, three, and four at a time, but Mr. Zombie explodes them with a hand slash. The Chief asked President Zhang for help, but she ran out. Mr. Zombie punched the ground and lifted the new city up. He grabs the Chief and hits him on the ground. Mr. Zombie asked him if he felt threatened now. Mr. Zombie cannot control the mind of a robot, but Chief is partially human, so he has a human brain. Mr. Zombie used a virus in his brain to read his memories. He was orphaned at a young age, and he went under body modification until his human body parts were replaced with mechanical parts. Mr. Zombie leaves him from the height because living for him is more painful than dying. President Zhang caught Chief, and she knows now that Mr. Zombie can read memories. Mr. Zombie packs his stuff because he lost control of his emotions again and became scary, even though he is a kind zombie. He is about to leave, but President Violet comes, and as he's about to hit her, she shows him the paper of his promotion to vice president, which stops him. From now on, Mr. Zombie is the vice president of the Beyonders Academy. Mr. Zombie doesn't believe in the chief's sign. He asked President Violet to confirm, and she told him that chief said Mr. Zombie is a good human. President Violet takes her leave, saying she is looking forward to a day when Mr. Zombie becomes president, and once he does, he can achieve the purpose for which he came to Beyonders Academy. On the other side, President Zhang angrily asked Chief why he kept Mr. Zombie still after knowing he was a zombie, to which Chief answered that it doesn't matter whether he is a zombie or human. Chief needs his strength to catch Professor Jamie. Chief is intended to clear every trace of Professor Jamie for good. At the zombie site, Varman tells other zombies they suspect that their king, Mr. Zombie, is hostage in the human city. Zombies speak to murder humans and save their king. Blackie and Agu understand Varmint was made because the king doesn't need anyone's help. They didn't stop Varmint because Blackie knew no one could stop Varmint other than the king. On the warship, Chief announced that they have only one chance to catch Professor Jamie, and regardless of the price have to pay. Mr. Zombie is at an abandoned place with Dawn, which is full of army troops. The 56th Regiment reports and greets their new leader, the Vice President, Mr. Zombie. The Central Command's 4th Division and the 56th Regiment report to Mr. Zombie that they will be following his orders from now on. There are 12,000 people in the 56th Regiment, and they request Mr. Zombie to confirm. Mr. Zombie asked the soldier if he would really follow his orders. He asked him what would happen if he told him to take his own life, and just as the soldier is about to take his life with a grenade, Mr. Zombie tells him to stop and throws the bomb away. Two mysterious figures make fun at Mr. Zombie by calling him a weakling. These two men are from the Steel Blade Department of the Stainless Steel Academy, and they were sent there to help them catch the target. The two are President Bang and Vice President Chui. The Stainless Steel Academy questioned them about why they promoted a newbie to the position of Vice President and gave him the important location to guard, which is an important part of the mission. The chief replied saying it's because Mr. Zombie could beat him to death but the stainless steel leader called him more powerful than the chief. The leader explains to the chief that he has deployed his two people, so there is no need for them to guard the exit. The boy tells Professor Jamie that the whole city is surrounded by zombies, 
and Jamie orders him to release them. The zombies are released, but the president and vice president of the Blade Department handle it. Mr. Zombie found that the zombies were not of his tribe. President Bang tells Mr. Zombie that he is not needed there and tells him to leave. President Bang makes a joke of Mr. Zombie by calling him a weakling again. Don called President Bang a weakling and told him to be quiet, which made him angry. Varman appeared, and the professor boy saw his level at max, and he might be intending to control him. Varmint scolds his mate, the little seven zombies, as they were shouting to stand with Varmint for saving the king. But even then, no one came except him. Little Seven gave Varmint gasoline and ran away because he couldn't disobey his king, Mr. Zombie. Varmint senses a smell, and a new subject is recorded on Professor Zombie's system. Varmint drank the gasoline and was ready to fight, unaware that Mr. Zombie had seen him. Varmint roared and came close to them. President Bang found him interesting to fight with. Mr. Zombie ran away with Dawn because even the two heads of the Stainless Steel Academy can't win against Varmint due to his undeemed body. The president called Mr. Zombie trash for running away, seeing that he was powerful and Vice President Chui went to fight first. President Bang was surprised to see Chui thrown to the wall. Before President Bang moved, Varmint came close to him and hit him too hard. Varmint twisted him, threw him to the ground, and at last kicked him to the tank. Varmint is about to cut him with his chainsaw, but he manages to stop it with his blade. Mr. Zombie is observing them fighting with Dawn. President Bang showed his confidence that as a president he wouldn't lose, but soon it turned out to be wrong, and he started crying for help. Varmint is so strong that a normal soldier can't withstand him, and Mr. Zombie wonders why Varmint hasn't recognized him, so he orders Dawn to go to Varmint and put some sense into him. Dawn hesitated to go, so he bit her hand and put a virus in her. President Bang is on the verge of losing, but Dawn went to Varmint and got his attention. Mr. Zombie puts zombie cells in Dawn that change her DNA and replaces it with genetic nucleotides that make her strong. Without wasting time on talking nonsense, Dawn starts shooting Varmint, and he bends down. Dawn jumps and fills Varmint's mouth with grenades. The grenades exploded in his mouth, but they didn't hurt him, and Dawn shot his face. The commander of the 56th Regiment wonders what Mr. Zombie did to Dawn, and he asks him curiously. Mr. Zombie modified Don's genes, and Don can still be more powerful. The president and vice president of Stainless Steel Academy are stuck in the crazy fight of the undead. Varmint moved forward with his chainsaw, but Don stepped on it and kicked Varmint away. Varmint crashed near the gasoline, and he drank it and continued the fight. Don shoots with a rocket launcher, but Varmint cuts the rocket and Don's body. Varmint reveals he is undead, and Don comes out of the smoke, revealing that she is also undead. Dawn becomes strong after the genetic mutation, but her bones are shattered and her muscles are torn. Mr. Zombie can use genetic recombination on Dawn to heal her, but she must bear the pain of dismantling. Mr. Zombie becomes angry at Varmint for disobeying his orders because he didn't stay at home. Dawn hit Varmint with the machine gun and he surrendered. Suddenly, Varmint sneaks up on Dawn and beats her up badly. Dawn, being relaxed, let her come to her original state, and she is injured now. The boy underground watched all this but didn't recognize Mr. Zombie's true power. Mr. Zombie comes up to Varmint and asks him if he knows who he is. The boy is controlling Varmint, but now he is unable to do so as Varmint sees Mr. Zombie. He went into a flashback when he first met Mr. Zombie. Varmint's pants become wet, remembering that moment. The underground boy is controlling Varmint, but Varmint fears Mr. Zombie that even the boy can't control him. Mr. Zombie was just standing in front of Varmint, but Varmint remembered the moment when Mr. Zombie punished him for not obeying him. Varmint remembered that because he has an undine body, he was cut into pieces and dried up on a tree for a hundred years. The fear trembled over him, and the boy's system exploded. Varmint returns, and the boy still has other zombies, but Professor Jamie stops him as they are about to come down on them. The base of Professor Jamie has six floors and extends to 11,000 square meters. The muscle head jumps from the plane and rotates down, with the sword reaching the right place. Professor Zhang tells them to use their brains because they can also be traps, but Chief also jumps from the plane, saying all traps are useless in front of absolute power. Chief, leave the second line defense to them. They went underground to catch Professor Jamie, but they didn't find him there while all the ways, including water, air, and land, were sealed. President Zhang and Violet are waiting outside the underground place. At a building terrace, Professor Jamie is standing with his team, 
and the boy is watching the inside and reporting to Jamie that they are inside and executed plan A. The plan is to make them break the glass and let them fight with the zombie king. But when they didn't fall for it, Professor Janie executed plan B, and a baby zombie came out that seemed harmless. Chief was aware of it and alerted his mate that the things that seemed harmless were the ones that were troublesome. The stainless steel leader cuts him, and the zombie king shows his true colors. The chief announced retreat, and the soldiers ran away. As the leader cuts the zombie king, it divides into two. The boy releases all the zombies to get them distracted, and with Professor Jamie, they can escape. President John comes forward to fight zombies. She kicks the zombies in the air and jumps up with the help of a tree. She cuts the zombies into pieces with her sword and comes down. The boy has no zombies left other than Varmint. The Blackie and Agu wear masks to avoid the zombie virus and are searching for Varmint because if they don't take him back, Mr. Zombie will punish them. The Zombie King is standing still, and the chief and the leader attacked him simultaneously. But he dodged them easily. The leader told him to stop running away and fight him for real. Hearing this, the Zombie King turns to a lady zombie. The Stainless Steel Academy leader attacks the Zombie King with his cleave blade attack, but she stops it with the tip of her finger. The chief couldn't help him because his arm was injured. The leader turns to model one, but before he takes any action, he is beaten to a pulp. Leader crashed near Blackie, and Agu shows concern to help, but Blackie refuses to help as they are zombies. President Violet and Zhang were shocked to see the leader losing, and he gave visual cues towards a lady zombie who is a zombie king. On the other side, Mr. Zombie is partying at an egg barbecue with stainless steel heads and Dawn. The behavior of the heads with Mr. Zombie has changed now. Mr. Zombie and Dawn hear an explosion. The Lady Zombie is standing in front of President John and Violet. Presidents are ready to fight. Mr. Zombie gets up to see what happened. President John attacks the Zombie King with her sword, but she avoids it easily. President Violet quickly moved and attacked the Zombie King, but she kicked her. Violet jumps and kicks her also. John uses her blade, but she dodges easily, twisting her body. Meanwhile, the leader turns to his true form and comes to confront the Zombie King. Both presidents attack simultaneously, but Lady Zombie turns into a big zombie with horns on its head and hits them away. The Zombie King told him to decide the win with only one hit, and they both punched each other. An explosion is seen, and after the smoke disappears, we see the leader's hand disappear with a zombie punch. The leader is standing in front of the zombie, but trembling with fear. Mr. Zombie went close to the battle place with the heads and dawn. The Zombie King shows him the true power to make the leader surrender. The Zombie King turns to his true form, and the boy controlling him reports to Professor Jamie that they can't control him further. The Zombie King hits the leader, and he returned to his original form. President Zhang and Violet sneak attack, but the Zombie King throws them with a flick only, and they hit the ground and fall on Mr. Zombie. The leader crashed to the ground but was still able to fight. Violet tells Mr. Zombie that it is the Zombie King that Professor Janie created. The Zombie King ordered the zombies to attack them, and President John told Mr. Zombie to order the retreat. Mr. Zombie threw the President down and roared, to which the zombies stopped in fear. The Zombie King asked who he is, and Mr. Zombie replied, if he is the Zombie King, what will he be called? All the zombies surrendered to Mr. Zombie. President John and Violet are cared for by Don and the heads of stainless steel. Mr. Zombie showed his true power form, and all were shocked to see him. The leader of the Stainless Steel Academy shows his anger at Beyonder's Academy for making a zombie vice president. The Zombie King set the condition that the one who survived would be called King. Zombie King punched Mr. Zombie in the cheek, but doesn't even move him, and he makes jokes of him as he has not eaten the food. Mr. Zombie punches the Zombie King, and he goes far into the air, crashing along the way, eventually hitting the ship. Professor Janie did not expect this, and they failed to get any information about Mr. Zombie. The Zombie King lifts the submarine and throws it at Mr. Zombie. Don realized they needed to change their location, otherwise, they would be crushed between the fights. Blackie is helping the Chief weld his parts, but they idiotically cut all the pieces that should be welded and welded all the pieces that should be cut. Agu senses Mr. Zombie's aura, and they see him piercing the submarine and going to the sky. Mr. Zombie lures Zombie King to come up and puts the rope into his neck and rotates him. Mr. Zombie pulled him aside and kicked him in the face. Zombie King holds the rope, trying to do the same, but Mr. Zombie breaks the rope and crashes to the ground near the leader. The Zombie King lifts the submarine and throws it at Mr. Zombie, 
but he dodges it and the submarine sinks in the ocean. Mr. Zombie lands on the warship and he asks the Zombie King if he likes to throw things. Soldiers on the warship ran away and the Zombie King challenged Mr. Zombie's abilities. Chief explains to Blackie and Agu that they need to go and catch Professor Jamie and he knows Mr. Zombie is strong but Professor Jamie is more important because he is a genius and people like him were once born in a century. Blackie explains to Jamie that no one can defeat his king, Mr. Zombie. Mr. Zombie punched Zombie King into space and threw the ship on him, which crashed to the moon within him. Mr. Zombie is standing on a cracked surface of the ship, which is the result of the force he threw the warship with. Presidents and Dawn are tired of running away to safety, as it's useless because the fight covers them anyway. The Zombie King throws the warship back to Earth and comes like an asteroid. Zombie King pierces the warship in the air and hits a nuclear reactor that explodes near Mr. Zombie. Presidents take cover to save themselves from the explosion. The smoke disappears and Mr. Zombie and the Zombie King land on the ship. The explosion is nothing for Mr. Zombie, but just an itch. Dawn thinks the fight is over, but the Zombie King's hand turns big and he grabs Mr. Zombie and gives him a proposal to cooperate and destroy the world together. He hit Mr. Zombie to the building with his hand, but Mr. Zombie resisted it easily and refused to cooperate as he had no interest in destroying the world. Chief suggests to Blackie that they should run because even Mr. Zombie became strong after his transformation. But Zombie King is not a weakling either. The Chief suggests they should save their strength and find the right time to strike them. Blackie told Chief to be quiet as Mr. Zombie doesn't have only one transformation, he can transform again. Mr. Zombie told Zombie King that he was not worth to work with. Mr. Zombie made a joke about Zombie King right in front of him. Mr. Zombie said that only weaklings talk about destroying the world and ruling it. Dawn wants to hear them, but she is far away. Zombie King talked big, giving him a lesson, but his face paled at seeing the second transformation of Mr. Zombie, who seems like a human. All were shocked to see his form and the Zombie King saw a face in the sky and seemed to be feeling threatened. Agu wakes up the chief to let him see how his king really looks. Mr. Zombie is different from Professor Jamie Zombie, and he seems even now. The rain starts, and the Zombie King is about to punch Mr. Zombie. But before he does anything, Mr. Zombie cuts him into pieces without even moving from his place. The rain goes from the ground to the sky, and everything starts moving up from the ground. The presidents, the ship, even the sea animals. A giant cyclone covers the earth. All the things start falling from the air and a whale falls on the building, causing Violet and Professor Jamie to be shocked. Zombie King is lying down broken to the earth. He can't believe what just happened. Even Professor Jamie has not seen anything like what is currently happening. Zombie King regenerates his body and reveals to Mr. Zombie that his effort is useless to him as he can regenerate himself. He can't hurt Mr. Zombie, but the Zombie King will not lose either as he is undestroyable. This approach turns out to be very wrong when Mr. Zombie pulls the Zombie King with his hand movements and grabs him by the neck. Mr. Zombie tells him that there is no need to physically destroy someone in order to murder him. As Mr. Zombie grabs Zombie King's neck more tightly, we see in ancient times the Cyclones, a robot-like swordsman with spaceships, and they try to attack human civilization for the sixth time, thinking it will be the last. But the human's fate changes, and Mr. Zombie destroys those who intended to destroy human civilization. The Zombie King turned into a corpse. Everyone is thinking the fight is over now. Mr. Zombie dropped the Zombie King from the building, and he didn't even move. Chief is surprised that the Zombie King is not moving, but Blackie tells him that he must be scared to death, fearing the terrifying form of his king. Professor Jamie is unable to believe what just happened. The helicopter arrives, and the boy suggests to Professor Jamie that they should escape, as there are no defense boats left for them to worry about, and it might be their last chance. Before Professor Jamie answers the boy, Mr. Zombie reaches them, and the boy is surprised at how he knows his location. Mr. Zombie orders them to surrender in one second, otherwise they must go to meet the Zombie King who has been scared. Professor Jamie and the boy surrender to Mr. Zombie, as they are left with no choice other than to surrender. Professor Jamie and his mates are captured by Mr. Zombie, and they go inside the prisoner transportation vehicle. Mr. Zombie feels bad for turning that scary, and President Violet orders Dawn to go to Mr. Zombie, but she fears him. So President Violet gives her the ambition of making her vice president in the future, and she goes to him to know his whereabouts. Mr. Zombie is hungry and just needs untearable clothes. Dawn asked Mr. Zombie if he remembered what he did, 
and he answered that he had done it but didn't remember it properly. Mr. Zombie tells Don that he lost his sense of time, but he knows for sure that he has beaten up many of those kinds of zombies in the past. The zombies he had beaten up were weaklings, as they don't need to be remembered. Professor Janey, after seeing Mr. Zombie's powers, has an evil intent to get his genes sampled and to create an even stronger being than Mr. Zombie. The zombie king that was created by Professor Jamie has already turned into a corpse. The incident with Professor Jamie has finally ended. Mr. Zombie is asked to become president, and he has no problem doing so. The president is responsible for maintaining and protecting the city. The president must exceed the city's population by 10 million within a time limit, otherwise the president's title will be cancelled. Mr. Zombie chose the city where he caught Professor Jamie. The H city is a deserted place where there is not even a single human hair. It's hard for him to grow the population there or develop the city. However, Mr. Zombie, without caring about the population, chose H City even though there were so many good cities as an option. Mr. Zombie's choice left all going crazy. After becoming president, Mr. Zombie's single army was expanded to four regiments in order to protect the city. Finally, the day comes that Mr. Zombie has waited for. Human soldiers are helping the zombies move into their new home. Blackie reports to President Zombie that all their citizens have moved to the city safely. A child is scared of the human soldiers, but he explains that President Zombie's orders are only meant to be done, and their work is to move the zombies to their new home safely. The President's zombie people are equal to his own people in the human soldier's eyes. Finally, zombies have their own city, and here we learn that to achieve something, you need to fight. Someone asked about Varmint to President Zombie, as he has been hanging for a few months. President Zombie orders to keep him hanging. Varmint is hanging from the strings on the terrace of the Zombie Town Municipal Council. Varmint is regretting what he did and will never do anything like that again. Zombies are thankful to President Zombie for giving them their own city. We see Violet lying injured on the broken wall, and there is no one other than Dawn who did this. Violet is shocked to see the new version of Dawn. She feels like she has two different personalities. Dawn is standing, and Violet comes from behind to attack, but is horrified to see Dawn moving her neck back. Violet dropped her sword and asked her if she was still human. Violet steps back, dodging Dawn's attacks. Dawn continuously shoots Violet, but she becomes angry and approaches Dawn quickly, urging her to show her most powerful skill. Dawn roars as the cells that President Zombie injected make her even stronger. Violet quickly moved close to her and attacked with horizontal slashes, but it didn't affect her. Violet cuts Dawn into pieces, but she regenerates her body, and seeing her do this, Violet is curious to know what President Zombie did to her. Violet has doubts if she is a zombie, but she tells Violet that she was examined in the lab yesterday and is fine. From the body to the cells, everything is normal. Violet asked her if it was so, then how was she able to turn her head 360 degrees, and how did she regenerate her body? Dawn can transform as long as she wants, and when she feels down, all she must do is inject a stimulant, and she will be even more powerful. The stimulant doesn't have any side effects, as she has been using it for a long time. Violet stops Dawn. Violet runs from the battleground, takes a flight, and hurries to H City. President Zombie assigns the tasks to the boss zombies. Fur is responsible for the Flower District. Ah Gan will be the head of the police department. Lang will be the head of the civil administration, and Blackie will be the one who is responsible for managing the city's money. Violet knocks on the door of the zombie council, and she hurries to President Zombie. Violet forces President Zombie to bite her hand and comes back in a hurry, thanking him. President Violet's assistant explains why she let her hand be bitten by President Zombie. As he can control minds, he can control her to do something bad. This is not her concern, as she knows she will gain insane strength and abilities to regenerate her body and never die. Even if he makes her dance in the center of the city, she doesn't care. Zombies start developing the city that President Zombie got. As President Zombie assigns work to his subordinates, the city slowly shows progress. The city now has a fashion store, a zombie hairdresser, zombie realtors, and even a driving school with 54 members already learning to drive. As Zombie began to live his life slowly, Inspector Chen was checking the stats of President Zombie, who, according to her, lacked leadership abilities. She doesn't understand the purpose of the Beyonders Academy making the zombie their president. Chen sees making a zombie president as part of the competition between academies, but aside from this, she doesn't like a zombie to be president either. He has no qualities to be a leader, and to confirm whether he is a zombie or not, 
Chen will only believe him once she takes a close look at him. At the North Pole, a professor named Strange and his team reached a place where an ancient corpse was buried 500 meters down into the ice a thousand years ago. They took out the corpse within the ice with the help of a crane and just observed the corpse's body. Suddenly, several people attacked, and someone shut the boy's mouth and hit the professor. Their leader ordered them to use the professor's team as a sacrifice, as they just needed some blood. One of them hit the ice with a sharp tool and woke up the lady corpse. The corpse is the blood queen, and the people wake her up and greet her. She asked them about a moron zombie, President Zombie. Blood Queen people report that President Zombie is alive and is as lively as he was. He tells Blood Queen that after President Zombie wiped out human civilization last time, he now shakes hands with humans and even is reconstructing his clan. This time, the Blood Queen has the will to win against him. In Guangzhou province at the academy headquarters, President Zombie is called by someone, and in the academy, there is a boy lying down. The doctors are trying to treat him, but he neither looks like a zombie nor a human. His eyes are red, and he is a member of the exploration team from the next province, which they found at the North Pole. Their provincial archaeology head, who is with him, is missing now. The man with red eyes is an ordinary person, but when two presidents went to catch him, he injured both. Violet thought to invite someone professional, like President Zombie, to find out what had happened with the red-eyed boy. President Zombie came in a car and went inside and shook hands with President Ying of Iron Club Academy. Ying knows he is the one who caught Professor Janie, and Ying seems to have evil intent. Iron Club Academy members make fun of him, calling him a weakling, while Chief is horribly scared to see him here. The researchers told President Zombie to look at the red-eyed boy and see if he can recognize who he is. President Violet asked curiously to President Zombie if he got something, and he found seeing the two teeth holes on the neck that it was the blood tribe behind the boy's condition, all thrown back through an explosion as President Zombie transformed. As Iron Club left with questions about why President Zombie explodes, President Violet and Dawn hide somewhere. President Zombie has sworn to murder every one of the blood tribe. He thought the blood tribe was already extinct, but the boy appears and asks about the blood queen, but the boy doesn't know anything as he became a vampire yesterday. Iron Club Academy members and the chief were horrified by the President's zombie behavior. Violet asked President Zombie what he found and what he was talking about, but before he completed his line, he forgot. President Zombie will tell them once he remembers the blood tribe. The Iron Club members whisper bad things about President Zombie, and he hears them. It's rainy and the blood tribe is hiding under an umbrella in an alleyway. Two people throw money at them, thinking they are beggars. The Blood Queen became angry, but she was stopped by her mate. She becomes angry at them for reviving her when their level has fallen that much. For 1,000 years, they had been living miserably since their majesty, the Blood Queen, was turned into a dry corpse by President Zombie. They lived hidden for 1,000 years in order to protect themselves from the threat of President Zombie. All they could do was hide from both humans and zombies and watch from afar. Even so, they had not left the tiny alley for 1,000 years. The Blood Queen is not as powerful as she was, so she can't fight President Zombie at this level. Lanling tells her that the purpose of waking her is to tell her that they have information about a man who can turn her into the strongest being, and the man is none other than Professor Jamie, who can make her strong. The presidents are watching Professor Jamie, and President Zombie asks why they just don't destroy him. It is because they need to know the hidden experiment and research Professor Jamie did against them. Professor Jamie has also put the spies among them, and the only way to reach them is through Professor Jamie. President Zombie raised the possibility of Professor Jamie's escape, but Ying told him he couldn't escape when he was locked in that way. Ying takes President Zombie to show him the prison he locked him in because he is the one who caught Professor Jamie. The prison is called State of the Art and was specially constructed for Professor Jamie. The depth of the prison is more than 3,000 meters. There are 1,500 floors on it and 100,000 armed soldiers, and even going to the bottom through the lift takes 30 minutes. There are many weapons equipped in the prison, rocket launchers, anti-aircraft guns, laser cannons, etc. There is a president on every 100th floor, so in total, there are 30 presidents and two chiefs watching this place. With this tight security, he can't escape, but if he does, he will die on the spot because Professor Janie is bound by the bomb detonator. The power of the explosion is more than a thousand tons of TNT even if someone goes close to him or tries to free him up. They will both die from the explosion. President Zombie feels shame seeing the disgusting actions of humans, and he takes his leave first. 
In a fairway alleyway, Blood Queen is watching Professor Janie, who is tied with a self-detonating bomb that leaves them no option but to reach him. Ying tells Violet that Inspector Chen is about to visit H-City because Chief Gang told her that President Zombie built a city for zombies. Ying really doesn't care whether the president is a zombie or not, as he only recognizes the strong. President Zombie is roaming around the human city, feeling that it is prosperous. Professor Jamie has a will to obtain the genes of President Zombie while they are about to be executed. Professor Jamie has a plan that the Academy will neither be able to murder him nor get his research because before they were caught, Professor already instructed his people to send his research data to a place that even Professor doesn't know about. The boy tells the professor that even if they obtain President Zombie's genes, they will not be able to create a stronger being than him because it's nearly impossible. If the professor gets a strong vessel to carry the zombie genome, then it might be possible for him to create a stronger being. Professor planned to escape, and a food delivery robot gave him food, but in it there was a communication device that was placed in Professor's mouth as he ate food. He communicates with his spy to get the location of the zombie king's corpse, and he tells him that it is kept in Dr. Yin's lab on the 200th floor. The professor orders him to keep following his instructions and guard the vessels. Violet calls President Zombie and tells him that Chief Gain told Inspector Chen that Zombie created a city for zombies, and Inspector is on her way to his city to look. Inspector Chen is the auditor of their province, and her work is to watch the lifestyle and behavior of all the presidents. If she finds that he is a zombie, he will be immediately fired. Violet told him not to act crazy, and she cut the call. President Zombie saw the makeup and got an idea. Inspector Chen Aeroplane is ready to go to City Hall, and she wants to find a reason to fire him because he is a weakling in her eyes. As dozens of buses fall from the sky, Zombie brings the news to Blackie that the Inspector Chef is about to arrive at their city for an inspection. So according to Zombie, if they want to continue living in this city, their only option to hide the living undead here is to apply makeup to their faces as quickly as possible. Accordingly, Blackie sends Ah to Area D and Lang to Area C to begin the makeup distribution process so that everyone disguises themselves as humans. The preparation process begins with Blackie himself disguising himself with foundations, powders, and lenses to look less like a corpse, unsure of whether it will even work or not. At one of the distribution places, a mother zombie and a child zombie come to take their share. The mother zombie explains to the child zombie that they must blend in with the humans unless they want to live back under bridges and forests, and she makes him understand that they must compromise as the world belongs to the human race only. The mother zombie puts on the free makeup and instantly turns into a ravishing looking lady, which brings out the F word out of the thrown off child's mouth. On the other hand, Ah and Lang return to Blackie's office to find out that he has turned into a proper femboy, whereas Ago, the budget Frankenstein behind him, looks the same as before except with lipstick on. Speaking of looking absurd, Ah and Lang don't understand how they are going to disguise themselves since their beastly appearance is entirely different for humans. So to make them look more tamed, Blackie makes them act like his pets and awaits Inspector Chen's arrival, fully confident that his master zombie's plan won't go sideways. They anticipate that the inspector will be arriving there by plane, but instead the inspector comes there, taking the train to throw them off and enter the city directly. Followed by her assistant, Inspector Chen begins her investigation by avoiding the people outside and decides to check on the civilians directly to see if the president of this city is truly good or evil. Her subordinates whisper to themselves, wondering why Chen suspects Zombie so much when he hasn't done anything bad like ever. They speculate that it must be because Zombie is weak and perhaps a pushover who deserves to be hated by a formidable woman like Chen but they also consider the fact that Chen has always been biased against everyone except for the overseer, whom she always seems to have a good impression of. Chen hears the two subordinates conspiring against her and proudly claims that she is indeed biased. She thinks that only her lord, the overseer, is capable of leading humanity and regrets the time when the overseer stepped away from his authority and caused a worm like zombie to become president. In the meantime, zombie is having his zombie meal and wonders how things are going, not being aware of the fact that Inspector Chen and her team have already begun their investigation in his ruling city. Inspector Chen's two subordinates keep debating over her bias towards the Overseer and wonder when even he has last shown himself to humanity. Apparently, the Overseer has gone out into the vast world to explore, so they hope that he will make his return to the country soon. Meanwhile, Blackie and his Spice Girls team wonder why Inspector Chen hasn't shown herself yet, still anticipating her arrival on an airplane. 
so Ago assumes that her flight must have been delayed and tells Blackie to wait patiently for a while. While they are completely oblivious to what's going on, Chen's two subordinates enter a shop, where they ask the shopkeeper if his products are all made of eggs, a total rubbish question to throw him off. The shopkeeper, of course, gets completely scared by the sudden human, and realizing that it must be one of the investigators, he turns around in fear and tells Chen's subordinate to come back another day. Chen's subordinates head out completely confused about what's going on and keep on investigating more civilians who also act strangely towards them, making them question if their city president, Mr. Zombie, has been oppressing them by any means. Funnily, in the middle of a questionnaire, a civilian's hand literally falls off his body as he is an undead, and while the investigator remains in shock seeing that, the civilian runs for it, claiming that his hand was just a prosthetic. Inspector Chen quickly realizes that all of the civilians in the city are dumb as bricks like its president, Mr. Zombie, and wonders why these people are acting so mentally slow like zombies. So she assumes that Zombie must have built this city only for lunatics and weirdos like him, and decides to remove Zombie from his position for creating a mental asylum instead of a human city. On the other side, Zombie reveals himself to be at a rooftop building, staring mindlessly at the sky while not talking to anyone. Ago comes there and learns from a soldier guarding Zombie that Zombie has been shaking and mumbling after consuming his last meal. Ago realizes that the dumb soldier must have fed Zombie a human spicy food, which is a stimulant that forces him to go into his berserk mode for at least one month, which means that the situation is only about to go south. Ago quickly informs Blackie about this sudden catastrophic situation and realizing that they have nothing to do but wait one month for Zombie to cool down, they decide to let things play out questioning whether the inspection team will survive berserk mode zombies terror. As predicted, a flying truck comes crashing down towards the inspection team's direction out of nowhere, followed up by zombie in his berserk form, who lands there, making a flashy entrance, and tells her that he has come here personally to give her and her team a great tour of this city. Chen's subordinates wonder what just happened to them, and as they notice that a literal monstrous-looking Mr. Zombie is standing in front of Chen, they realize that this must mean serious business. Chen, of course, doesn't recognize Mr. Zombie in his berserk form, so she asks for his name first. He doesn't give it to her first, of course, and first mocks her for easily forgetting the president of this city, telling her he is the person she has been looking for all this time. Chen, of course, doesn't believe Zombie's words, as she is certain that Zombie looks weak and frail and not this manly. But Zombie insists that it is him, stating that he just took off his innocent-looking mask. Emanating a menacing aura, he comes near Inspector Chen, telling her that he has specially prepared some gifts for her since she has come from far away. At a snap of his fingers, many zombies in disguise come with the finest cans of spicy eggs near Inspector Chen and offer them to her, to which Chen gets even more dumbfounded. But before she can even consider touching a meal, Zombie tells her to prepare herself as their tour has just begun and jumps away with her into the sky so that they can have a better view of the city. Chen's subordinates wonder how they are going to help in this situation as they cannot simply chase them. Still, they grab a cab and begin to head in their direction. Both Ago and Blackie also head their way as they know very well that berserk mode zombie means Inspector Chen's death. Zombie carries Chen to the top of a fairway skyscraper, showing her the entire city from the skies and telling her how much he has been investing in the city for its development. Of course, Chen has no interest in any of it as she is scared to death. But Zombie keeps on blabbering as he doesn't care and tells her all about the city's new business companies to construction workers and promises that everything is in law and order. He jumps down in the streets with her, and while dragging her numb body down the road, he tells her that everyone obeys the traffic rules here, and if someone doesn't abide by the rules, they are sent flying away. Just as he says so, he kicks an overspeeding truck driver away along with his truck, which comes crashing into a skyscraper that looks awfully like the gherkin. Chen accuses Zombie of murdering the innocent truck driver as she assumes the driver was human, but Zombie assures her that all of his citizens are fine because his Justice League-like superhero team subordinates are always there to save lives. Speaking of saving lives, Chen's two subordinates rush there to save her and quickly take her away from Zombie before he can hurt her further. Zombie lets them go for today, showing them mercy even in his berserk form, and makes it clear for them that this city can only be ruled by him and no force in the world can stop it. Chen's subordinates, while carrying Chen away from the city, wonder how a human can be so mighty and strong and decide to fire that goofball who initially reported that Zombie was a weakling. Chen gets up, as he doesn't want to leave just yet, and shouts at Zombie, 
admitting that he has done quite a decent job managing his city. But she doesn't admit that he has enough combat power as that is too necessary to protect an entire city. So she tells him to prove it to her, but before she can invite her own death, all of Zombie's subordinates close her mouth. Unfortunately for her, Zombie has already heard her wish, and he agrees to show her the lengths of what he can do with his power. Accordingly, he takes everyone to a fairway seaside beach to demonstrate his powers. Right before Zombie begins, Ago blames all of whatever is going to happen next on Chen, telling her that it was her fault that they fell into the current situation. Chen, who is of course confused hearing Ago as she doesn't understand what to be so scared about, soon realizes what she is dealing with once the pebbles on the ground begin to levitate because of Zombie's power. And as he channels his final form, the human zombie, Chen and her subordinates get left with their mouths wide open, as they cannot believe whatever Dragon Ball live action they are currently witnessing. At Zombie's command, the waves of the sea begin to rise, and the air pressure changes. In the blink of an eye, Zombie literally teleports to Saturn, and once Chen confirms it through a telescope, Zombie keeps on jumping from planets to planets, making the inspectors realize that there is no universe where Zombie is human. Zombie keeps on showcasing his true power, simply by clenching his fist and punching in space, which causes a massive force to hit Earth like a catastrophic level asteroid. This triggers a tsunami, and a heavy earthquake, wreaking havoc everywhere on planet Earth, making even Violet's team wonder what in the world is happening. Once Violet steps outside, she gets bewildered by the level 12 tsunami, as she figures that is definitely the end of the world version 2012. The government activates their defensive barrier to tackle the tsunami, but unfortunately, it is of no use as the massive waves easily pass through the barrier. In the meantime, literal Anime Superman makes his return to Earth and asks Inspector Chen first if what she has seen yet is going to be enough for him to rule over a city. He literally reverses the tsunami using his superpowers and saves Earth from the disaster that he himself created. Now that he has shown enough proof of his worthiness, Inspector Chen takes her leave while repeatedly calling Zombie a monster who makes actual monsters feel like weak humans. Ago, on the other hand, gets worried as he thinks that Zombie went too overboard with his shenanigans, leaving a possibility for Chen to confiscate the city from them. However, Blackie doesn't think that is going to happen and assures him that everything will go smoothly, as their master himself is also looking very confident. Soon after, Inspector Chen gives Zombie's city silent approval, bringing a momentary happy ending for everyone. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, a giant hole seems to be dug through Earth's crust, where many scientists are trying to revive Zombie King, who was previously murdered by Mr. Zombie. The lead scientist there wonders how much the Zombie King would have developed by now if Professor Janie was still there with them. Furthermore, he also talks about the possibility of humanity's progression if Janie had chosen their side instead of his own. But that's too much of a deep topic, so they change the subject and discuss whether they will even be able to resurrect the Zombie King. Although everything seems unclear through Professor Janie's secret instructions, a scientist mixes some deadly chemicals carefully and injects them inside the Zombie King's body while nobody else is looking. Just as he does so, the President Level X Men Cyclops looking guy pushes the scientists away and immediately demands an explanation. But before the conspiring scientists can say anything, the Zombie King wakes up from his slumber and wreaks havoc in the research facility that is almost three miles under the ground. With his reflection, a ray of hope lights up on Professor Janie's glasses as he visualizes himself destroying humanity once again with the Zombie King's help. So he instructs him to destroy everyone at the lab and free him so that he can inject Zombie's DNA into him and make him even stronger than before. An airplane that is almost about to cross that underground lab facility is revealed to have been hijacked by some terrorists who want a huge sum of money. The one in charge of this airplane hijacking reveals herself to be a woman who is so broke that she cannot afford clothes for herself. She reveals her intentions to break out Professor Janie from the prison cell, and after learning that he is strapped up with a self-detonating bomb, she tells her subordinates to not worry and choose violence by any means to save Professor Janie. The woman then commands her subordinates to launch themselves down in the hole and seeing them attempting to enter the locked prison. The stunned primary guards prepare themselves to defend their territory. However, the invaders easily dodge all of the soldiers' attacks and begin to make their way to the lower floors. Meanwhile, Zombie Kane, who has now completely defeated Cyclops, expresses his hatred toward Professor Janie, telling him that he has no intentions to save him as he simply does not consider him to be important. 
Professor Janie smirks at this foolish remark and tells Zombie King not to be egoistic by thinking he is the second strongest on this planet. He claims that he can destroy the Zombie King whenever he wants to because he is his creator, threatening to end him if he doesn't play by the rules. Zombie King, who of course doesn't believe Professor Janie's words, calls it a bluff, but upon hearing that Jamie intends to take his own life after fulfilling his dreams, Zombie King decides to help him reach his goals, asking him to make him as strong as Zombie in exchange. The broke woman's subordinates continue attacking the guards of the prison, who can't help but wonder who these psychotic ninjas even are. The woman also arrives there, giving the guards two choices, either hand Professor Jamie to them or die. As the guards show no signs of cooperation, the woman looks down, preparing to demonstrate her true power, which cannot be judged by her lack of dressing sense. Within seconds, she disarms all of the guards there, making the spectating soldiers mumble mommy as they get too scared of her. They open fire on her melons, but the bullets just reflect off her, making it clear that she is truly invincible. At the same time, on the lowest floor of the prison, the zombie king rescues Professor Janie from his cell. Although there was supposed to be a bomb that would explode if anyone went near Jamie, nothing happened because Zombie King followed Jamie's plan to cut off the prison's power, which caused the bomb's sensors to go offline. Jamie's associate gets somewhat scared of Zombie King, as he has turned disobedient, and asks Jamie whether they can actually trust him. In response, Jamie tells him that there is no better vessel than the Zombie King, and that's why they must do whatever it takes to make him the strongest. Once they reach the top floor of the prison, they find the dead, lost, and defeated soldiers and the mysterious woman who has been waiting for them all this time. Upon seeing Jamie, the woman comments that the Zombie King is not a suitable candidate to be his vessel, as that candidate couldn't even bend a single hair on Zombie's body when he entered his second phase. So the woman proposes to Jamie another idea, which is to use her body instead of the Zombie King's. Upon hearing her words, Jamie, not being able to believe that this crazy B-word also knows about Mr. Zombie's additional forms, turns to the Zombie King, who expresses his anger towards the self-proclaimed queen who called him weak moments ago. The Zombie King laughs at the spectacle, as he cannot believe that this B is suggesting that she is stronger than he is, being the alpha male he is. Of course, the queen is not all talk, and to prove that she is indeed mightier, she lunges towards the Zombie King and instantly knocks him away with a brutal shockwave punch. This sudden change of atmosphere completely lets down Jamie, as he was confident that Zombie King was the chosen one. But now that it looks like that is not the case, he can only wait for things to unfold on their own. Zombie King, who realizes that the punch he just took is as strong as Mr. Zombie's attack, wonders how a mere human can be this strong. Yet he doesn't get scared and prepares himself for a counterattack, deciding to take all of them down with him by destroying the nuclear reactor above them. As he blasts off the nuclear reactor, the white-haired self-proclaimed queen remains calm, makes a small gesture with her right hand, and reverses the explosion process, neutralizing everything. Not only that, she lifts up the entire reactor and dumps it down onto the zombie king to punish him for his idiotic move. As he gets pummeled, the blood queen mocks him for calling himself a king, even though he clearly isn't worthy of his title. She closes the distance between them in the blink of an eye, grabbing him by his throat and asking him how zombie managed to murder him even though he is immortal. Although Zombie King doesn't want to talk with this arrogant lady, upon realizing that her gigantic melons are enough to crush him into bits, he speaks up, understanding that both she and Mr. Zombie are from the extinct civilization. Blood Queen gets bored of this loser, so she chokes him to death using her raw strength and yanks his body down on the ground. Professor Jamie, who initially gets taken aback, looks with an evil smile as another opportunity arises as he realizes that he has now found a better vessel to make his strongest creation to murder Mr. Zombie. On the other hand, Violet comes to Mr. Zombie's office at the municipal building to have a talk with him. Ago tries stopping her from seeing Zombie, as he doesn't want Violet to see Zombie in his berserk mode. But Violet doesn't care whether it's the right time or not and keeps walking towards Zombie, pushing poor Ago away from her. Ago again warns her not to go, stating that things are currently too dangerous. But being the arrogant idiot Violet is, she doesn't listen to his warnings and heads on inside and finds him having a drink of red liquid, perhaps blood. Zombie in his second form gives an evil smile to Violet, which gets her agitated, so she asks him why he is in his destructive form instead of his usual carefree form. Zombie only offers her an evil smile in reply and asks her instead what her business is here today. 
Violet explains that she has come here to report to him about Professor Jamie and Zombie King's escape from their prison. Upon hearing this grave news, Zombie's expressions did not change. It's as if he has already anticipated that something like this would happen because the guards were a bunch of weaklings. Violet doesn't understand how Zombie can act so normal in a situation so grave and asks him if he already knows about this. In reply, Zombie explains by saying that he can feel Little Red activating her powers. Of course, by Little Red, he means the Blood Queen, implying that both of them have some sort of history. According to Zombie, he can feel whenever Little Red activates her bloodline power, and that is why he knows that Professor Janie has escaped. Learning that there is a new enemy at hand, Violet decides to report this information to the higher-ups immediately. But Zombie stops her from running away, telling her that they still have quite a long time to waste and inviting her for a drink. He asks her out on a date, inviting her to have some food with him, and even offers to show her around his city. Violet, who clearly isn't in the mood for anything, tells Zombie to not even think of treating her the way he did to Inspector Chen, revealing that she knows everything. So Zombie lets her go this time, but before leaving, Violet stops again as she is curious about Little Red's bloodline power and realizing that Zombie must have the same power as well. She changes her plans and decides to go on a date with him to get her answers. At the same time, at a hospital, the defeated presidents of the prison cell get treated by world-class doctors. One of the injured presidents among them barely speaks and begs the doctor to call the head of his department as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Professor Jamie and his team arrive at his new secret base, along with Miss Busty. There, Jamie immediately begins to analyze Little Red and gets super excited with the results. He exclaims that her nature defies all scientific principles, as her body is completely stupendous. Little Red's associate asks Jamie to not conduct any dumb experiments on Little Red, as that could harm her and tells him to first confirm that Zombie's genes can actually be used to improve his beloved queen. Jamie's bowl-cut associate assumes long hair that Jamie and his experiments are at the pinnacle of all human beings, and there are no chances of any failed results. With everything getting a green light, Jamie explains that the only thing he is going to need to increase the strength of Little Red is to extract Zombie's genes by any means. Of course, Long Hair doesn't think he can pull even one of Zombie's hairs by himself and asks Jamie if he is dumb enough to send everyone to their demise. Fortunately for them, Bullcut reveals that he already has Zombie's genes with him, explaining that he extracted them from the Redhead, who Zombie shared his DNA with earlier in the story. When that redhead went to Professor Jamie to check whether she had turned into an actual zombie, Jamie underwent a full body inspection on her and drew a vial of her blood. Thanks to that redhead twin ponytail's mistake, Jamie can now create the biggest threat to mankind and immediately begin his experiment on Little Red. On the other side, Violet and Zombie go to a restaurant on their date where they discuss Zombie's powers and how he ended up in his second form just by eating some spices. Considering that things like this are too dangerous, Violet asks Zombie if there are any other stupid things that they should avoid in their way. Zombie laughs at Violet for thinking he is some kind of bomb that's going to explode if you make the wrong move. She also asks him about his bloodline powers, but before he can answer, he reverts back to her original form, revealing that the side effects of the spices have worn off. This means that there will no longer be any cool stuff going around with their date which gets Violet mad as she expected something exciting to happen between them. She doesn't take this lightly and starts scolding Zombie like a crazy witch, telling him to go back to his berserk form. She asks the waiter to bring something spicy, but because everyone wanted to avoid Zombie getting crazy, they confiscated all of the spices out of the city. And that means this is the end of their date and the changes of information. Around two months later, at the hospital where the injured presidents were being treated, a blue-haired woman visits the injured president and informs him that she has used their satellites to send the message that he wanted her to deliver as soon as she got the news of what had happened. The blue-haired woman, although she believes the president's story, doesn't understand the fact that every single one of them was simply defeated by a broken woman in her underwear. The president claims that the woman in her undies was not someone from their generation and reveals that she was even able to suppress a nuclear reaction with her sheer will. The blue-haired woman tells the president not to worry anymore as she has sent the message to the department head and promises him that the department head will soon take care of things alone. Somewhere at a locked research facility, two unidentified armed soldiers talk about how this place once used to be a city and now is completely underground, indicating that the city got somehow destroyed. Their team leader, the department head, who reveals himself to be Inspector Chen's beloved overseer, 
gets the news of the emergency and decides to put a temporary stop to his expedition so that he can take care of the situation. The department head, who was paying his full attention to a body looking as if it were burned, conducted an analysis on it and concluded that it was the remains of a person from ancient times. The corpse, according to the department head, has a total of 134 fractures in it, and based only on that information, he determines that this corpse was most possibly injured and murdered by some kind of monster. Overseer also finds this funny fact interesting that all the remains of this corpse were burned to their limit and assumes that that is the reason why it hasn't rot even after a thousand years. Because it's basically an empty shell now, it cannot be used for any research, which lets down the overseer. While he is completely upset, another researcher on his team finds traces of a big battle there and surprisingly notices a crazy level of technology, meaning that the ancient civilization must have been able to create many monsters, which somewhat hints at how Zombie and Blood Queen were created. The Overseer focuses on the emergency for now and calls his team to head out of there when suddenly one of them comes across a mysterious mark carved on the ground. This mark automatically activates a security measured cloaked guard who gets excited upon seeing a human after this long time. While the others panic seeing this mysterious individual, Overseer remains calm, as he knows that it's just a projection. The cloaked projection turns toward the Overseer as it admires the Overseer's innate strength and offers to make him even stronger than he currently is. However, the cloaked projection tells the Overseer that in exchange for his increase in strength, he will have to vow his life to protect human civilization by any means. Even if the projection didn't add this condition, the Overseer would have done so anyway as he is a hero, so he moves on from the chit-chat and asks it directly about the ancient extinct civilization. To explain how humanity got exterminated, the cloak doesn't say anything and instead shows the Overseer a picture of Mr. Zombie. Apparently, approximately a thousand years ago, the Earth didn't have only two continents but had seven of them and eight great oceans. Back then, there were over a hundred countries, and the leaders of those countries kept increasing humanity's power and gathered all of their resources to build starships to wander around the infinite unknown space. At that time, humanity fought many aliens using their advanced technology and even slayed monsters hidden in the darkest depths of Earth. However, a mere zombie was the only one against whom humanity could not win, and that zombie was none other than Mr. Zombie himself. One of the soldiers whispers to the overseer, telling him that the virtual cloak dude must be tricking them, as the monster in this picture doesn't look strong at all, rather it looks like a stuffed toy thrown away. However, the overseer doesn't judge a book by its cover, and since he knows that the people of the extinct civilization won't gain by making jokes about something like this, he decides to trust the cloak projection. Moreover, he also considers the reason that their current sole existence has been basically around fighting zombies, which also solidifies the unknown hologram's claims. This discovery makes Overseer realize that maybe it is because of Mr. Zombie that humanity isn't able to fully exterminate the zombie race even after a thousand years. So the Overseer asks the cloaked guy to tell him how he can defeat Zombie. In response, the cloaked guy tells Overseer that in the past, humans were only focused on improving their technology. But now that humans are focusing more on their physical strength, the only way to defeat Zombie is to combine both technology and innate strength. As he says so, he brings out Thanos' Infinity Gauntlet and tells Overseer to put it on. However, unlike Infinity War, I don't think he will be able to make Zombie vanish into thin air just by snapping his fingers. Overseer instructs one of his subordinates to take the gauntlet to a safe location now, as he first has to deal with the Professor Janie situation. On the other side, Violet learns about the Overseer's return and informs Zombie that the Overseer has called all the presidents for a meeting so that they can make up a plan on how to deal with Professor Janie. At the same time, Professor Janie and his secret lab successfully creates his best product, an even bustier-looking Blood Queen. The long hair, on the other hand, who is completely bored as he has nothing to do, finds a penny in his pocket, and that makes him wonder how he is going to feed his tribe's members. He wonders if he should work 10 different jobs a day and gets so depressed that he starts to even consider dying himself. His female associate tells him not to be so upset and gives him the idea to rob a bank since they are pretty much invincible. So Long Hair agrees to the proposition and decides to head out immediately for a quick bank robbery. While the presidents gather at the Guangzhou province's headquarters to meet with the department head, Long Hair and his comrade prepare to do their bank robbery. However, the bank they are trying to rob is governed by Blackie, which means that things are only going to get worse from now on. 
As the robbery scene takes place, Blackie notices his right from his office while taking a sip of his coffee and heads right in their direction to make them pay for their foolishness. Long Hair also realizes that he has made a mistake and chose the wrong city to rob a bank and will have to face the consequences for his dumb blunder. In an instant, Blackie starts summoning his powers, scaring the life out of Long Hair and his accomplice, so they quickly make a run for it, recognizing Blackie as Zombie's mysterious subordinate from around 800 AD. Blackie shouts at them, telling them to return their money, and makes his intentions clear by smashing into the building, which creates massive shockwaves, breaking even the sound barrier. As the vehicles literally begin to fly in the air because of these powerful shockwaves, the citizens question whether Blackie is going too overboard with it. Long Hair realizes that he has no chance of escape, so he rather comes up with plan B and tells everyone to split up and report back to their queen that they have ended up in unnecessary trouble. Long Hair gets out of the car hoping to hold Blackie off till his accomplices escape, but before he can even see it coming, Blackie punches him away and goes for the others to stop them from running away. Back at the headquarters where the presidents have gathered for the meeting, everyone greets the department head, the overseer. The overseer thanks everyone for their warm welcome, and before moving directly to the topic of Professor Janie's escape, he shows them the golden gauntlet he has received from the mysterious ruins. The overseer calls this gadget a worthless piece of technology from ancient times and reveals intentions on not using it against Professor Janie, but to use it on an even bigger threat that is the scariest monster living on planet Earth. He tells him about the monster that has single-handedly wiped out the entire ancient civilization. And as he goes on to describe that monster, who is none other than Zombie, Zombie comes there to have a closer look at the Golden Gauntlet. Violet asks the Overseer if such a monster can actually exist, and if it does, where its current whereabouts are. The Overseer explains that he only knows about the monster's appearance and has no clue as to where it is so it will be up to them to find out where it is, like searching for a needle in a giant haystack. Zombie excitedly turns to the Overseer and asks him how to use the Golden Gauntlet. The Overseer explains that he doesn't know how to do it as the ancient person didn't give him any instructions and once again refocuses on looking for the monster when he suddenly realizes there is no need to look for the monster as the monster is standing right beneath him. This realization shocks the Overseer so much that it brings the F word out of him, and recognizing the threat, he instinctively goes for the gauntlet to fight and eliminate Zombie. Out of nowhere, Long Hair, who was getting his butt kicked by Blackie, flies coincidentally straight into where the presidents are, which makes everyone wonder what in the world is happening. Followed by the Long Hair, Blackie makes a flashy entrance in the distance. The Overseer's subordinate analyzes Blackie as a zombie, so it instantly marks Blackie as a threat, not knowing that he is actually an ally. All of the presidents also start attacking Blackie, not knowing he is Zombie's subordinate, so they end up getting their backside rightfully whipped as well. The sudden chaos alarms the Overseer, but before he can do anything about it, Zombie himself comes to calm down Blackie and delivers a deadly blow to him to stop him from causing any more disruption. Meanwhile, the Overseer puts on the Golden Gauntlet, getting ready for the fight, and acknowledges the fact that Zombie does have immense strength and power. Zombie tells Blackie that he cannot murder humans as they are his allies, who were the ones who gave him the city. As he proceeds to go back to the headquarters to fix up the misunderstanding, the skies suddenly turn dark because of a complete solar eclipse, which the Overseer claims to have not been responsible for. And that means that a third party is soon to be joining them in a three-sided battle. Of course, that third party is none other than Miss almost flashed everyone every single time, the Blood Queen. The Overseer realizes that everything is going to get chaotic from now on, so he quickly instructs everyone to evacuate the entire city, taking the entire task himself to deal with the Blood Queen. He then quickly goes to fight the Blood Queen, who again doesn't miss flashing him and also kicks him away. Lackey decides to support Overseer since Zombie has said that he is their ally, but Zombie himself stops him from going, saying that Overseer and Blood Queen's fight is none of their business. The Overseer tells the Queen that after dealing with her first, he will deal with Zombie. The Blood Queen scoffs as she thinks that the Overseer is nothing but a big talker, and so she asks him if he really thinks he can win against her with his puny abilities, let alone Mr. Zombie. Hearing the Blood Queen's remark, while the Presidents are puzzled as to how Zombie is related to her, Zombie remains in silence and shows their concern for the Overseer, as he is sure that nothing can be done against the Blood Queen. 
but it seems things will go as planned for the Overseer as he utilizes the Gauntlet's powers by activating its button and begins to gather powerful energy to use it against the Blood Queen. But before he can launch his attack, the Blood Queen lunges towards him to stop him midway, telling him that she will deal with him first before going for Zombie. With both realizing that their common goal is to fight Zombie, they still consider themselves to be enemies and launch a full force punch against each other. The two sides' fists colliding against each other causes such a loud bang that its impact pushes every president away and numbs their ears for a while. The Overseer's gauntlet gets completely deformed by the Blood Queen's punch, making the Overseer realize that the gauntlet was a complete scam and had little to no power in it, explaining why the ancient civilization wasn't able to defeat Zombie. Before finishing the already worn-out Overseer, the Blood Queen commends him for being the strongest human being she has met in the past thousand years and calls it a shame that their battle had to end like this. As she goes on to deliver the finishing blow, Violet teleports behind her to take her by surprise. But of course the Blood Queen senses it and moves away in time to avoid the slash aimed at her neck. As she looks at her new opponent, Violet, she finds out that Violet too has zombie-like powers. Violet, of course, attained these powers from Zombie by forcefully making him bite her earlier in the story. Dawn, too, transforms into her zombie form and attacks Longhair's accomplice to stop them from doing any more of their shenanigans. The presidents, with a look of disbelief, question how Violet became this strong and realize that something must be wrong. Dawn's opponent, Miss Ponytail, scoots away from her and tells her to stop treating her like she is a small fry. Dawn keeps treating Ponytail like a small fry and mockingly asks her to prove that she is not a small fry. But Ponytail disappoints her with her small and frail attacks, so Dawn starts playing around with her, leaving the other president's jaws wide open as they could not understand what type of steroids she took to get this jacked in no time at all. Ponytail tries to break the fourth wall and bait the viewers into joining her only chairs, but we viewers remain resilient, so she makes dozens of clones of herself to attract us even more. But unfortunately, that too doesn't end well, thanks to our savior Dawn, who super kicks her chicken-like face and causes her clones to dissipate. On the other hand, the Blood Queen begins her fight with Violet, who looks to be on a whole different level than before. Her single slash of her sword with her exaggeratingly strong strength creates such an impact that it cleanly slices off many buildings in the city. The Blood Queen soon realizes what is going on and calls Violet out for using Zombie to become stronger. She reveals that she too has been strengthened thanks to Zombie's genes and she reveals her own form that she can take thanks to Zombie. As he transforms into her new form, she tells Violet to step away, as she is here to only fight Zombie and not anyone else. However, Violet doesn't move a single muscle, as she thinks that she can still fight the Blood Queen with the current strength she has. And because the Blood Queen has changed her form, just like Zombie, Violet too decides to go to her second form to make their fight interesting. As she takes on her new form, she begins to form purple energy inside her hands, creating a light purple mist in her surroundings. As her transformation comes to an end, she reveals her new ugly face, which should look scary but only looks like badly done makeup. But hey, the presidents do look scared, so that's a win-win, right? The Blood Queen begins to contemplate her life, as she cannot believe that Violet is also blessed, like Zombie, to have different forms. But that doesn't stop her from attacking Violet, and because Violet is a swordsman, she too decides to fight with a sword and quickly summons a sword that realistically speaking should only be yielded by Inoshuk from the Demon Slayer. Violet enhances her own blade and successfully lands several deadly blows on the Blood Queen. But she doesn't stop there as she knows that the Blood Queen is invincible, so she continues slicing every single cell in the Blood Queen's body and completely wipes her out. However, the Blood Queen still doesn't die and regenerates her entire body from a single cell like Michael Jackson from Demon Slayer. First she steals Inosuke's sword, now she steals Muzin's ability, and uses it in the scorching sun. This is just not fair. The Blood Queen's body regenerates right above where Violet is standing, and her hand also builds up again from the skin. With her body restored, the Blood Queen doesn't forget to flash even a woman as she stands completely naked in front of Violet. The other presidents who are shocked to see the spectacle continue staring at the Queen not because they are interested in the fight, but because they want to see more of the Thang. Zombie realizes that the Queen is about to get serious, so he changes his place while spectating the fight from afar and tells Blackie to change their location to have a better look. Yeah, of course he wants to have a better look now that the Queen isn't wearing anything. Violet breaks the silence and referring to Zombie as a petty fellow, 
She tells the queen that Zombie has told her that the queen is an undead old monster from over a thousand years ago. That is why her magic and abilities cannot be judged with normal logic. The overseer, upon learning this, gets excited as well, learning that someone from that time exists, and tries to question her. But because he is too injured, he decides to lay there till the end of the fight. The queen turns the day sky into the night sky once again and gets ready for the second round of their battle. The queen makes several slashes towards Violet and cuts many buildings down into pieces of cake. But Violet remains unscathed and uses the broken building as stepping stones to close the distance between her and the queen. As they both engage in a head-to-head -head battle once again, Violet uses her full power on her next attack and completely cuts down the entire city. However, the queen still remains alive, to the point that even Zombie himself becomes mesmerized by her. On the other hand, the overseer tries to take off the gold gauge from his hands. But no matter how much force he uses, the gloves just don't come off, hinting that they can actually be used in the future. Violet realizes that even in her second form, she is no match for the queen, but she doesn't give up and keeps on fighting even after taking several serious blows from the queen. Some unknown entity gets inside the overseer's head through the gauntlet and apologizes in advance for borrowing his body from him. As the gauntlet emerges with all of overseer's cells, it starts taking control of him, making him realize that the ancient person must have really tricked him. Violet agrees with the queen that she cannot hurt her, however she reveals that the queen too cannot hurt her because of her regenerative abilities thanks to Zombie's genes. The other presidents no longer being able to take this injustice, demand that Zombie give them their fair share. But Zombie doesn't agree to do so, as he calls the process and the effects too violent for mere humans, completely disrespecting the blue-haired president. All sides collision takes a momentary stop as, out of nowhere, an extraterrestrial being makes their entry to Earth, all thanks to Dumb Overseer who activated the gold gauntlet. The extraterrestrial being's gigantic foot starts to land on the Earth. Its foot is so large that even a building can't reach its height, causing everyone to panic, wondering if God himself has stepped foot in mankind's territory. While the other has no idea what is happening, Zombie 2 shows his disbelief at what's going on. The building that he and Blackie were standing on starts to crumble as the figure lands its foot on the ground. So Zombie makes up a plan to do something since he has zero idea of what is happening. He first rescues all of the civilians from being trampled and also rescues the presidents as well. After saving each and every one of them, Zombie finally notices the face that was about to crush him using its hands. However, before it can grab Zombie, it teleports away from him. Overseer doesn't understand why Ancient Person is doing such things and desperately asks for an explanation. So the Ancient Person from before appears behind a cheap copy of Marvel's Galactus and explains to Overseer that he is being sacrificed for the sake of humanity. On the other hand, the mysterious Galactus, like being, manages to grab Zombie using its fingers and tries his best to squish him into a pulp. But Zombie keeps holding on to his own, showing that even in his small size, his powers and strength cannot be messed with. The two girls, whose fight is now ruined, team up temporarily against overseers taken over by the body, only to fail as the new guy easily captures them. Zombie at the same time uses a fraction of his strength in his second form and starts twisting Galactus's fingers with so much force that it causes his entire body to bend and twist. Getting free from Galactus's hold, Zombie climbs up towards its head with the goal of taking it down by targeting its head. At the same time, the Overseer rejoices in his revival and comes towards Zombie for their rematch after a thousand years. So Zombie gets serious and gets to his true form to begin the actual battle between the two godly beings. Zombie, who now looks human in his true form, keeps climbing up on Galactus while completely ignoring Overseer. So Overseer summons his Mecha soldiers immediately in order to get Zombie's attention. However, no matter what he does, Zombie smashes through everything in his path and keeps on moving. So, the Overseer summons two more Galactuses to make Zombie take things seriously, apparently because the human form isn't Zombie's true form as well. With a single punch, one of the galactic beings whacks Zombie away to the moon, getting him pissed off. While Zombie is busy in the cat and mouse chase, Overseer asks the ancient person why he thinks of Zombie as a bad person, as in the current era, he has not a single bad track record. According to the reports that Overseer has received, Zombie has been keeping his city under good care, and not only that, he also generates tax revenue for everyone, which helps further increase the development of mankind. Overseer also mentions that Zombie never hurts humans, rather he helps them whenever they are in need, and that is why he considers coexisting with Zombie.
However, the Ancient One has other beliefs and tells Overseer to shut up with him supporting a monstrous entity. The Ancient One explains that humans can never coexist with zombies, as they are just an insignificant race derived from humans. They are such insignia that a random missile should be enough to eliminate them all. But because of Mr. Zombie, the zombie race cannot be eliminated and human civilization is on the brink of extinction. That is why an entity like Zombie shouldn't be allowed to exist, as he can rewrite or delete humanity's entire fate with a snap of his fingers. With the pure will to erase him, the Ancient One inside Overseer's body summons a holy sword and prepares to erase Zombie using the divine punishment from the gods. He summons seven more of his galactic beings, and as all of them pierce their swords into the moon, where Zombie is currently, they prepare to explode the moon. But Zombie doesn't want any more destruction, so as said before, he destroys all of the galactic beings with a simple snap of his fingers and saves the moon from being destroyed. He then goes directly for the Ancient One to murder him before he can summon more galactic beings and cause even more destruction, punching him back into Earth's atmosphere. As the Ancient One takes the heavy blow, he fails to regain control for a while and wonders how he is supposed to defeat Zombie in this form, let alone beat him in his final form. In the meantime, the presidents help the citizens evacuate from the city when suddenly they notice the ground beneath them is starting to tear apart. Zombie reveals that this is his doing, and as he keeps on ripping the ground from its core, the people of Earth get hit with a 20 magnitude earthquake, leaving everyone questioning if anyone's life matters at this point. Zombie, with a big smile on his face, creates a massive hole inside Earth, for God knows why, and starts fighting the Ancient One in his true form, the Super Saiyan 3. Both Violet and Queen remain dismayed, as they have never seen Zombie in the Super Saiyan 3 form, which makes them wonder if he has even more forms like Super Saiyan Blue or maybe Ultra Instinct. The Ancient One gets excited, as this very form is the one that he had wanted Zombie to use, so he gets ready for his ultimate attack to destroy Zombie. Unlucky for him, Zombie simply tears him apart by moving his hands and squishes him into a pulp like a mosquito. As he then rips the Ancient One into pieces and throws him around, Every president gets tears in their eyes seeing their leader, the Overseer, being murdered just like that. Thankfully, Zombie is literally God in this story, so he uses his powers again and completely regenerates the Overseer's body again with a snap of his fingers, making him respawn then and there. As the sun rises again, the Overseer gets his life back, making every single person witnessing this phenomenon wonder what in the world is even going on. Overseer himself fails to believe that he is alive again just after being unalive and turns to Zombie to realize that he was the one who resurrected him. Seeing the majestic version of Zombie, the Overseer finally realizes why the humans from the previous civilization were so desperate to get rid of him. It was because they feared him and his godlike abilities. They feared that one day Zombie would announce himself as their god and take over Earth. Violet rushes to see how Zombie's doing and finds him to be back in his original, rusty, and innocent form. Zombie gets happy seeing Violet and awkwardly asks her if she is getting used to using his bloodline power that helps them change their forms. Violet takes a deep breath and starts scolding Zombie for destroying the entire continent, treating it like his personal playground. Violet asks Zombie why he played around like that and kept fighting if he could have shot him like that. Zombie explains that that wasn't his intention, and he only wanted to make it more dramatic to make himself look more heroic. Regardless of Zombie's irrational actions, he gets treated as the hero. After this event, the southern continent shifts away by 130 kilometers, all thanks to Zombie's dumb stunt to increase his strength by deadlifting Earth. His actions completely changed the entire climate of Earth and created the new deepest trench, the Zombie Trench. The reconstruction process begins quickly, as there were not too many losses of life, and two quick months later, the entire city begins to be rebuilt into its former glory once again. Overseer reveals to be still investigating Zombie and his four forms, and still contemplating what they should do against this who knows what created this god. He calls one of the presidents and asks her to buy a few trays of high-quality eggs, as he wishes to visit the new chief of H somewhere else, Long Hair builds his own city for his tribes and hires Zombie Zombies to help them construct it. Blackie reveals that he was the one who gave a loan to Long Hair to help him build a city, as his master, Zombie, wants everyone to have a good, peaceful diplomatic relationship. But because unlike Zombie, Blackie is not generous, he also reveals with an evil smile that he has charged Long Hair with high interests and intends on making his tribe work for 300 years to pay the debts off. 
It sounds like Blackie is treating long hair like Germany after World War II. Long hair asks Ponytail where their queen is and learns that she has been locking herself inside her room frequently after realizing that she is no match in strength to zombies, and that is why she no longer has a will to live. After seeing Zombie's new godly form, the Blood Queen, who has always pursued power to defeat him, finally realized that she would never be able to catch up to him. So she keeps on shedding her tears, hoping that some evil being will again come up with something that will help her become strong once again. Speaking of evil beings, Professor Janie finds the archaeological site where the department head overseer found the Golden Gauntlet and came across the Ancient One. But instead of being interested in that, Professor Janie shows his interest in the corpse that Overseer claimed to be an empty shell. What is he up to this time? That's it for the second season of this manhwa. Give us a like and subscribe for more videos. See you next time.